Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8.52. And of course, we're playing as Britain. So let's continue this. We are continuing the Italian campaign here. Oh, everything's starting to pop up already. Okay. They're, of course, attacking us here, and we're holding out nicely in Bangkok. That city's probably a ruin by now with all the fighting in it. Small ship engines have advanced. That's nice. And most likely grayed out. Yes, okay. So, let's look for some other 43 technologies that we could research usefully. See, like some of this stuff, well, some of it may upgrade, but some of it won't upgrade current units, and I'm not building heavy ships at the moment. So that's sort of some of the things I'm looking at. Here it's not purely the year date or whatever. Single units airborne. I'm not gonna do too much desert fighting, don't think too much. Commandos. Not definitely. Staying away from some of the you know, German type things that we don't do use. Salt guns and whatever, I'm not going to build any of those. Your car may be tempting me. materials and appliance. The only thing that we really are concerned about is oil and fuel. Sure. Please. Well, then I guess we're going to push ahead with some 44 technologies. Yeah, camouflage designs. Let's go with it. Maybe get the DPM a bit earlier. The Brits did do some camo. Um, you've most likely seen it in the movie Bridge Too Far. But it was, at least, I'm only used to seeing it on you know, airborne troops and commandos, not the regular infantry. That's what I'm used to seeing from photographs. Like I said before, I really don't care what provinces we hold to a degree. Um, I prefer not to give up these two ports here. This one and this one. So I'm trying to keep a buffer. So I'm sending up units here to keep the fight going. Okay, medium fuel tank. Now that should open up. Now, more. Okay, well, since we're doing a lot of these guys, let's research there. And attack ground crew training events. That's very good. But, and we can, of course, get that more up to date. 
But I would prefer to get the aircraft up to date. I, you know, I'm not that worried about, well, I don't know. We seem to be doing all right for air operations, and I don't know that morale, not that it's not helpful. It is. It's just what is more helpful, at least in my mind. Now, looking at the USA, I was doing that just before. Going, man, if they had, you know, I, you know, fortunately, the AI, combat AI, is still being worked on for Arts of Iron 4. Steel Volt is doing a good job. They've also brought in, <coughs> oh, one of the other heavy hitters they have over at Paradox to help them out on some of this stuff. And, uh oh, we just had a, another division shatter. Um,. I have, you know, AI programming, it, I have no, no real information at all on it, you know, experience, really looking at it, understanding it, but I've read a few articles about it, and, you know, if you're trying not to script in, sort of, shall we say, stupid things, you know, stuff that, well, yeah, it works, but only in certain cases, like, you could um, script in something like Japan will send um, two infantry divisions here or something like, you know, you can script all that stuff in, but then the AI would keep trying to do, and uh, you know, even if it didn't make sense kind of thing, you know, so you can, and some of that stuff might be useful, you know, Britain will hold Gibraltar with a minimum of, well, there's a good division there. I don't need anymore this one here um, we were worried about Spain for a while um, you know you will hold Gibraltar uh, you know at all costs or something like that but unless you're doing that kind of stuff and of course they're already here um, it's a very interesting sort of dynamic situation for AI, so submarine engine advance. We are doing a little bit of research there. But. All right, I'll switch that over to medium. We have prototypes here. Okay. Um. So, you know, I, you know, what the talents are of a person. And also, um, in writing an AI, um, processing power, because it's, you know, not, and another division shattered. We may have to give up those ports, but I really don't want to give up, whoa. Okay, give them a way to advance. Combat width is reduced, which helps with some of the stacking, and we're going to let that go. Continue. Um, you know, processing this AI going here, you know, do we, you know, attack? What's the, the, the parameters? Do we defend? And all that, you know, the processing power to manage this. But... You're having to do it for this, you know. All these little decisions flowing that if you write too dense of an AI. And they're just pushing me back here. I'm not liking it. We do have some additional units coming, which... 
I've been very concerned about that recently, the additional units. I don't want to reinforce failure. Let's use the other one. I think it's going to get to move faster. Yeah, and carry every, every last use. I think it's just maybe one good division left. But no. Let's see. You know, reinforce failure like I was... I know I'm jumping around here a bit, but... They're tying me up here. And I want to be dynamic and ready for... Um, I'll leave my wrong key down. Ready for a D-Day invasion in which we can support things. I sort of kind of know it's coming, well, eight, nine months away. Not forever. Sort of hoping all these units will get reinforced back up to some reasonable level by then. Although they're not heavy hitting units, they definitely have to fill the line. Well, you can get there. Before they collapse. So, you know, like I was saying, it's good that they're still working on it. So I have hope of getting bet. It's getting better. But man, if the U.S. were to now, maybe the AI is looking at. Oh, Britain's dumped all these units in there, and we've sent in some units, or were put in there by the, you know, by the, you know. Events and whatnot. And yes, I am watching to make sure none of these are getting over a run here. So I don't think any of them have been. Okay. We've got some good units there now. Hopefully they'll be able to hold. Hopefully, but I don't hold out too much hope. Let's get some of these HQs out of this first line. Here. As you know, I like to use HQs in combat when they have some combat strength. So I'm going to get a few there. And just dumping in more units, they, it may be evaluating it as simply overburdening the supply system. Maybe something as simple as that, but you would think with a better AI, they'd be shipping in units into here or something and invading Greece or doing a D-Day invasion on their own, as it were. But now, what is... Russian front one's like, oh, well, that's a bit of a change. No. Yeah, they've, they've pushed out further now. Um, had been that they were holding back in here, so the Germans and Finns pushed. Oh, and they've got Murmansk up here. Okay. So they're doing well there, which is not good news for us. Yeah, that's not the best news for us. Attack pilot training, okay. Yeah, organization is also very useful. I'm still a bit more onto the... actual good planes. And, oh, these guys made it and we're going to send them back. 
don't need him hanging around. Possibly just be attacked for the fun of it. And how are we doing? Okay. Well, our offensive here didn't work out as we had hoped. I was holding the ports because I'm hoping the U.S. has supply lines coming straight into them. Which would mean... Better supplies for these units, better upgrade, or um, reinforcements. Or if they start pushing us down and we lose these two ports, supply may become an issue here. Or more of an issue. Or so far I've not seen any little red uh, the supply triangles recently at least. Now also don't get me wrong, I'm you know, um snows begin to fall. Okay, winter is coming. Yes, that has become famous. People naturally see and notice things that don't work well. Realize the other there's another great game out there. I quite honestly have never really played it. Um I've never owned a copy and I've fiddled around year, millions of years ago at one game convention. Um, it, it's called World in Flames, and it's developed by this Australian group. Just sort of one s good step beyond um, Advanced Third Reich, the board game Advanced Third Reich. This was a whole the whole world, and if you're really sort of playing it, um, they sort of you know play it on a wall. The map is just huge. Well, they've turned it into a computer game, um, and you can get it from Matrix. The problem with it is, um, now it's sort of a turn base, and it's, it's really just a faithful um, computerization of the board game. And I really like that, um, though, when you buy the computer game, you get the actual game. It's 100 bucks. You actually get the, um, the documentation for it, which is the rules for the game. Um, so it's, it's very complicated. And not, that, that in and of itself doesn't um, scare me. It, does sort of slow things down but um what well, there is to my understanding no ai for it period so um now i think you can um you know pick um you know i don't know exactly how it's broken down between different um countries you know factions or whatever you want to call it but i think you could you know play the allies you know everybody in the allies so that it would be you know versus somebody maybe somebody playing the soviets and somebody playing all of the axis or something like that so um i don't know if you're trying to record four or five guys trying to play play all of this moving every single unit meaning nothing moves until you tell it to move and that kind of thing so um that's fine but because, you know, we're talking about the AI here. They haven't invested in the ability to, to make a, a reasonable AI for it. And so you get things like that that just, you know, aren't at this, are a more, in some ways, a more detailed game, particularly more than Hearts of Iron 4. But if you take out the, um, the AI... You know, what do you got? You know, you got multiplayer on a computer, which is which is very good and very fine. I'm not knocking that. It just just not the same for me because yes, currently I'm making this series and I could set it up. I don't know every Sunday or something have have a group to get together and we record it. But beyond that, I like love just the idea of oh hey, I've got a half hour to kill. Let me load up my last save of whatever game that I'm really playing play it for a half hour, and then shut it down just whenever I want. And so that, to me, that's fabulous. And that's why I'm such a big fan of um, Hearts of Iron is, yeah, if somebody comes out with a better game, um, I'm there. But until they do, no one's come close. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I'm complaining about things, but so far they're the only ones that have been able to do it. 
Now, if you know of a game that's a grand strategy, it doesn't have to. I know there's War in the East and War in the West, and I've thought about doing that. Um, some good stuff there. I've seen um, a little bit of that. I haven't, I haven't gone in and played it, but, um, but you know, more of like the Europe, whole European theater or whole Asian theater or whatever, a little more dynamically. Um, that's doing better than um, Hearts of Iron? I'd like to know. Now, now there's other games, you know, we, out there that are good. That, that isn't the point. It's just to this scale. Okay. Heavy aircraft armaments advance for our ships. So that's under what is cruisers. Yes, so we'll stop that research. And since we have all the 43s there, we're going to start Doing single engine fighters, improve those. Tall boy bombs. Let's see how our bomb design's going. Okay, now just off the 44s. Yeah. And they've lost the Hornet. Okay. And agricultural industry. Money minus 500. We can well, barely afford that. And gain supplies, which is nice. Which we really don't need. 100 manpower. Which we really don't need. So I'm going to go not now. No, we don't need that. Yeah. We'll take those. We only have about a thousand, whatever. Don't know what that really represents, but pounds, dollar, thousand dollars off. That's supposed to be ten million dollars, ten billion dollars. I don't know. Okay, U.S. or ASW, sorry, ASW. Escort carrier technology allows construction of that. Okay, that's good. Um, yes, yeah, so. I think that's done. Yeah, probably in the carriers, wouldn't it be? Yes, okay. Well, right now, because we are facing a bit of production or upgrade problems here. We're not producing anything, so I'm not going to... Well, I do want a bunch of those. Oh, that's hardly going to need. I see it's popping to the top. Get that out the way and done. And that allows me to... get all those fighters. Great. Fusag! We have established the fictitious first U.S. Army group, or FUSAD. We put General Patton, um, feared among the enemy, as the commander of this army of inflatable tanks and other vehicles. Ha! Huh. Hopefully the, this disinformation helps further establish our diversionary attack as being real in the minds of the Germans. Excuse me, we can only hope. Okay, well... Probably most of you know the, the general outlines of Patton's career in World War II and the controversy. Um, he said a few things to soldiers who um, probably, I would say, legitimately had battle trauma. Now, you sort of kind of have to understand, one... They didn't, back then, ha you know, they're still sort of shell-shocked. And that was obviously a World War One term. And obviously, they studied it a lot. But they really didn't know a lot of it. And I think Patton and others would realize, yeah, there's a real thing called shell-shock. And um, if you've gone through a horrendous situation, you're under that those thing, uh, that condition, and a lot of those people were, um, 
you know, catatonic, just sort of like totally, you know, non-responsive. Others were um, just constantly, literally like shaking in fear, you know, the, the tremors, even when they were asleep. I mean, there's just, you know, but not everyone has those extreme of um, conditions and not everyone gets the conditions under um, the most extreme. Now, so they didn't necessarily understand it like we do today. Plus, there's also another situation going on that we don't face today in our at least modern American or modern Western wars is, um, I don't know, the desperation of, of the situation. Um, and I don't want to in any way diminish um, the very brave work that a lot of soldiers do and that there are many cases that a situation becomes desperate. Um, reading about um, like some British experiences down here in Basra where a you know, small base or something, um, they get surrounded, they're outnumbered, there's you know, a, a squad, a platoon or whatever, you know, small unit in a sort of fortified, literally civilian type building and they're up on the roof fighting it out and the enemy are mortaring them and they're, yeah, that's an absolutely as desperate as, you know, it can get and they stick to it and fight and that, that isn't, that isn't what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is the idea that, oh, we need to put in 10 divisions and fight those 10 divisions desperately up the, the length of Iraq constantly, daily, like we're sort of seeing here. In Italy, there are no, um, you know, similar scale and situations. Again, whether you're a veteran here, you know some. I'm not saying at a personal level of an individual soldier, like I was talking about, or, you know, whether it's a squad, a platoon, you know, even a company or something that gets into a fight with an enemy that is a desperate and hard fight, and they go through that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying divisions, corps, aren't um, dealing with that kind of thing. So, a general needs to keep um, the soldiers fighting because you don't want a situation where um, a little bit of pressure means the, um, the line buckles because you've got to win the war. You cannot lose the war. You can lose a battle or two. The British were famous for losing sort of the old theory that we can lose all the battles except for the last one. Presumably the last one wins the war. Um, so when you look at it in that way, you have to sort of um, have a level of discipline. Um, I've read enough examples at different times that... Um, commanding officers of units, um, companies, battalions, or whatever, you know, talking, we're under this horrendous barrage, and we can't move forward, and somebody shows up and hears, what barrage? Oh, we'll see all the, yeah, yeah, but the, the battalion uh, on the other side of the hill is taking ten times as much fire, you know, that artillery landed around them, and I'm thinking like this in the Civil War or other types of wars um, than just World War II. You know, taken ten times as much, and they've advanced and taken their objectives. And a lot of this happens when you get officers, not that they're cowards at all, but they have not experienced the war. And what they see as a um, a dangerous situation, and it is dangerous. You're being shelled by the enemy, um, but one that means a halt, a pause, a we need support kind of thing doesn't need it. So um, if you don't have that sort of discipline even at your commanders or on your troops to move forward when you say to move forward even though you know but we're, we, we can die and no, I know an officer knows some of you will die but we're still going forward into whatever. So when Patton encounters some soldiers that he believes after um, seeing some wounded soldiers in the same hospital, after um, seeing dead soldiers and having combat losses as well fairly nearby him, um, 
sees these guys that can't take it anymore. He is, and he, you know, snaps. Um, you know, so what do you, you know? Yes, he probably overreacted, but also, how do you keep everybody going forward if they realize, oh, hey, not even a, not even as a conscious, I want to get out of being hurt situation, but just sort of like a sort of a subconscious, well, this is too much to take. We better fall back. We better not um, push forward. We better, um, you know, take take more caution, take more care. And so you'll get a defeat of them in the army. Um, and so that's sort of what Patton sees. And I would sort of say this is very much an example of the Italian army. Um, I am very much not a racist, but I am a culturalist. And that may have a similar sort of connotation. Um, not necessarily that I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I hate any cultures out there. Just like elements of, of cultures. Um, but, you know, of other cultures and maybe some elements of my own. But um, the idea that, um, okay, this is very good. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm digging into the weeds here. Uh, I've read a very various military history books. Um, and Keegan, I think, with with one of the uh, histories of warfare. And there were there's um, the Eastern way of war and the Western way of war. Um, and for the most part, you can't get an Eastern person to fight the Western way of war. They just refuse to do so. Now, that has no absolutely nothing to do with their race as a genetic thing, because you can get Eastern peoples, say, grown up in America, and they're going to fight the Western way of war. And, okay, um, the Western way of war basically is to overwhelm your enemy um, by direct assault, attack it straight at them, um, and break them. That is the Western way of war. Um, it is almost universal to to the Western peoples. Um, it is shown very heavily right along the, the borders of East and West. And um, typical of the Greek um, hopolon, hopolite troops, the phalanx, which was actually longer spears, um, you know, into a, you know, uh, uh, you know, more than a spear. It, it was, uh, um, you know, a pike, a really long um, thing in which they used mass numbers. They used um, tightly coordinated um, marching drills and moved into the enemy. The Eastern way of war is to defeat your enemy's morale by picking at its edges, um, whether it's cavalry riding around and dealing with the edge edges of your formations or hordes of archers again trying to envelop and deal with um, the edges of your enemy and um, so you're constantly now the Greeks did have slingers they did they definitely understood you know artillery of the the sense of you know throwing things at your enemy they never they didn't do a lot of a lot of bows some but not a lot I'm not nearly to the level of in the east and so um, they would sort of do this, the Eastern, and when they fought each other, would, you know, sort of do these, this type of war. Keegan explains it much better than I'm doing, I know. Um, that at one point, by sort of, if you will, dancing around each other, even on a huge battlefield, at one point you will get the situation where the morale of the you, battles, particularly, I uh, say mo most all cases, Battles are won or lost at the morale level, ultimately not, you know, if you kill enough of them, the morale of the enemy breaks. Now, it may also be at that point they are, you know, useless anyways that you've killed enough of them. But normally in classical battles or other, you know, pre-high um, explosives and guns, um, is normally you killed enough of the enemy that then the morale breaks 
or you know, you've harassed them enough, you've convinced the enemy that, that they're going to lose enough, and then they break, and then you start the real killing. You know, once they turn and run, um, then you start chasing them down. That's when the um, sort of the Eastern way of war is then the sort of, um, you know, um, ground troops come in of the, you know, the, the spear and shield types. Not that they never clashed without it. It's, there's no truism. There's no, you know, 100% set formula. But if you look at this, the standard operating procedures in the East, so that those kinds of troops would come in and really sort of only hit hard after they've been significantly weakened by the sort of sparring tactic where the West would come in, hit them hard, and um, do that. And so this continues throughout history in the Eastern and um, Western ways of war. You can see it in the Crusades. It's, you know, it's different tech in the Crusades. Sometimes it's a regression. Um, the um, the medievalists who were reading some of the um, and Renaissance era were reading some of the yeah more Renaissance era were reading some of the descriptions of some of the, the battles and um, wars that had now leaked back into the West out of the, after the collapse of Byzantium and they couldn't imagine how you could use um, a big um, spear or a pike and a shield they literally couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, and so they, they figured, I don't quite, you know, and a lot of them, they didn't have um, good access to original um, uh, images and their written descriptions. They just, so the famous sort of um, started out with the Swiss, the pike block, were pikemen with no shields. Because they saw these really long um, pikes, and that you needed two hands, where the Greeks and sort of perfected by the Macedonians used basically equally as long pikes with a shield, so that they're you know, and that was into the Renaissance. So there was some regression in military technology with the collapse of the ancient world, but you still see um, this sort of Eastern way of war versus the Western way of war, and. Um, part of it is very much a mental condition. And the way I sort of wanted to illustrate this was, is that at the end of the Napoleonic War, um, you know, the Ottoman Empire was shown to be weak with uh, various Napoleon and other um, French Anglo battles down in, in Egypt and other places. So, there was a move in the West to help the Greeks free themselves from Ottoman rule. And there were various, various um, British adventurers and such that came and um, helped the Greeks fight, fight out the war. And a lot of these people um, had read um, various uh, classical tales of Greek fighting. You know, um, in the old days, of course, it was the, the Persians not the Ottomans. But what they found just sort of shocked and horrified them, in a way, um, is that the Greeks wouldn't fight. Oh, they'd get their guns, and they would sit up in the hills, and then they, when they got enough numbers together, they would go down and, and strike at some um, Ottoman group. And if they're sort of sniping it was you know with muskets you know mostly i think smoothbore um muskets and such but um didn't work out they'd flee back into the hills and and these guys a lot of them veterans of battles like waterloo and the peninsula campaign were just come on guys let's just get organized let's get our muskets put fix our bayonets on and we'll just charge down into those those turks and they'll flee you know in front of us, you know, as we, we stick it in. But they could not get the Greeks to use a bayonet, basically. I mean, I may be overstating it a little bit, but they really couldn't do it. And so they just didn't understand because they knew who these Greeks were because they had read of Sparta and the Athens and all of these um, various battles. They didn't quite have access to all of what we have today, but, but they had access to a lot of the classical materials, these educated men that were going down. 
and then uh, the less educated but um, adventurous NCO types and whatever, they knew how to fight and win battles, but they couldn't get these Greeks to do this, and they just never did. And I don't, I don't know if the Greeks have ever, I'm sorry if there's any of you watching here, but I don't know if you've ever recovered your Western way of war. Um, you, they did fight very well against the Italians, but um, I think it was as much fighting in the Eastern style as it was anything else in the sort of lack of Italian leadership. I know we'll get back to that in a second. I know we're, we're running around through all this, but hope it's interesting. Is so that that and so I still think they are. Um, mentally um, still focused on the Eastern way of war. And so essentially these are um, more or less the same peoples, but they have been occupied so long by the Easterners that they've developed the Eastern mindset. There's one place that was never occupied by Easterners, and that's out here in Corfu. Um, I think that's, yeah, this is Corfu out here. Um, yeah, part of the land, small island. Because this was part of Byzantium, this island out here, that before before Constantinople fell, um, it had been taken by the Venetians, and it was owned by the Venetians through the um, you know the Renaissance era and onward, and held by the Venetians until basically sort of the Napoleonic Wars happened, and um, first sort of the the, Brit uh, the the French and then the British took it and for a while it was sort of a semi-independent state under the British while the rest of the mainland Greece was um, occupied still by the Ottoman Empire and the British wouldn't abandon it to allow the Ottomans to take it and that sort of was part of the elements that drove into the um, the British into freeing Greece but so the Greeks had all been influenced by the Turks and their long occupation there. So this is what I look at as a cultural explanation. It's not race, it's culture. So, you have the situation with the Italian leadership. And so I don't know how much of the Italian poor showing in World War II. Some of it is material, okay? They had, the Carcano rifle is acceptable, but just barely just as a rifle. Um, the Brita machine gun, that's their, I think I'm pronouncing it right, um, used to look in all these in the books, is sort of the, the if you will, the, the Italian version of a brand gun, or a BAR. Um, not in its mechanical operations, but it's in its role. Now, it's a bipodded machine gun, and it has a um, fixed... 20 round magazine meaning you the magazine there is you can't physically remove it from the gun so once you shoot your 20 rounds you sort of there's a catch it opens up and it swings out and then you use four stripper clips to reload that mag that 20 round magazine and then you're back to firing what a ridiculous concept now i can understand that magazines are a bit more expensive and you know just that they cost more to manufacture and more material than a stripper clip, and you might go, eh, we're not going to fill magazines in a, in a factory and send them out loaded to the, to the front. That's, they're bulky, it costs too much. They're not a throwaway object. Okay, I get that, that they're not a throwaway object to some nations. The M16 magazine almost sort of was in Vietnam, but not quite, but, but getting there. Um, so that your magazine is not a throwaway object, and you don't, you know, have 200 magazines per gun. Okay, I get that. And if you're using the same caliber as your your infantryman, you've got lots and lots of stripper clips running around of ammo. Okay, I get that. So give them six, eight magazines to a gun, and your assistant can be reloading the magazines, or one of the assistants to the gun, reloading the magazines while you're using the other five or seven or whatever it is, you know, so that he's reloading those things while they're operation, operating out there and not having to pause your machine gunnery to reload the magazine, you know, four stripper clips each time. That, and like several other features on the gun, um, it was worked sort of nice at the range in a nice environment in Italy, 
did not work well in the desert. Um, needed to be oiled to function well. And this is more so the, what is it, the Ravelli machine gun. That's their tripoded heavier machine gun. That even more so. Um, needed to be um, oiled well to, to function well. Well, in the field, even in southern Italy, but in the field, there's lots of dust. And there's an incredible amount of dust down here. And a well-oiled gun is just going to attract that dust like all hell. And so you're going to get a machine gun that doesn't machine well. That it constantly jams. So the Brita did. The Ravelli did. I uh, hope I'm getting pronunciations right. I know the guns just... I don't know if I'm pronounce, pronouncing the, the names right. So they had some god-awful equipment, the Italians did. They really did. Had some god-awful equipment. So that's one factor. Two, I don't know how much the national character, somewhere between are they really the conquering heroes of ancient Rome that um, Mussolini thought that they were and should be, or had um, years and years, generations, shall we say, generations and generations of foreign occupation of Italy. Now, in Italy's case, it was occupied by uh, other um, European, so it wasn't a Eastern situation, but that the Italian mindset got to the point that the authorities weren't their authorities, they were a foreign authority that was, um, you know, not necessarily bad rulership, but it wasn't, they didn't have an investment as who, who's going to be the Grand Duke locally or whatever. They really didn't care because it's either this guy or some other guy it's going to be the same for, for me being a farmer or whatever. It ain't going to change. So when you had the Austrians and some, some you know, sometimes they were, the rulers were Habsburgs and sometimes they were Bourbons. And um, the Habsburgs sometimes ruled, that's why they sort of got there um, in um, Spain. But then you had the Bourbons taking over. And so down here, the kingdom of two Sicilies. And then for a while, there were two kingdoms of two Sicilies. You know, two kingdoms of two Sicilies. Um, so there were four Sicilies somehow. But by, with a Bourbon king, but it was sort of backed up by Spain. Spain direct controlled some areas. Um, you had the Austrians, Habsburgs coming in from the north, and various other things. So the Italians had lost... And they regained a fair amount of their patriotism and national pride, most assuredly, under Victor Emmanuel and um, the first or whatever, uh, and the king and Garibaldi during his reunification of Italy. But that was more just throwing out um, corrupt rulers, if you will, um, that weren't locally identified in creating a, a national identity. So I don't know if the Italian cultural mindset you know, definitely was no longer the Romans of classical Rome, however much Mussolini wanted to think of them as such. And so, yeah, they weren't that, that's for sure. They also weren't um, universally in love with fascism. I think they liked elements of it because you're going from a um, very, very agrarian society to a um, industrial society, and during that phase, and this is what you see in some various states and why you have some of the rise of communism and fascism, but you have great dislocation of people, and you can talk about, and I do believe that capitalism is the best possible. Uh, you know, we may have, I know I have some socialist viewers, but um, what is it Churchill said? Capitalism's sin is their bounties are unequally or unequally distributed. Socialism's sin is that its miseries are equally distributed. So, um, capitalism is a bountiful system. But capitalism as... Now, that's different than state capitalism or crony capitalism or whatever the, the current term for government-controlled run economies that allow private ownership and use. Different situation than that. But true capitalism wants businesses and whole industries to fail. The whole design of it it's not even design, it's sort of a, the free market concept, is that, yeah, General Motors is going to go out of business. Hooray! Because that going out of business means that something else is happening that's going to replace it. Now, there's going to be great dislocation during it, 
Now, if you have a reasonably well-developed society, you may go from being a high-wage auto worker to being a low-wage uh, McDonald's worker to then, two years later, to be back being a high-wage, I don't know, computer manufacturer or whatever it might be is that you flow through these various jobs and your the economy goes through it and it's much more bountiful and um, developing than anything on a socialism um, level ever will be, even with the disruptions. But people don't want to lose their well-paying jobs, and there's government interference, and so you get the problems. Well, that's once you get a relatively mature um, industrialized economy, and it works reasonably well. What happens, or you go through a transition period that isn't artificial like Britain did or Germany did, in which you move through the stages as industry develops, you move from an agrarian to an, um, to an industrial economy. What happens is when you have instant industry showing up and you have but primitive, un unindustrialized farming, you have a massive amount of people that are farm laborers that all of a sudden you have various um, industrial changes. But you don't have um, the rapid corresponding availability of jobs moving from one to the other. So you do have situations where you have to the point of, and especially in a society that doesn't have the ability to have, you know, you can talk about a, I'm not a libertarian, hardcore, pure capitalism with no um, states um, beneficent, uh, you know, um, safety net cushions so you know unemployment insurance you know I'm, I'm for a certain level of that um, but when you don't have that in a society and you have the situation you can have starvation so people look for other solutions than and I'm not saying that ever in the period pre Mussolini that it was a capitalistic Italy I think it was more of a state capitalism as opposed to free market capitalism Maybe I should state that more clearly. I don't know that Italy, and I just don't know, Italy was ever really a free market capitalist situation, meaning somebody wanted to start a business, they just sort of start a business. I think it was more state-governed, controlled. Um, I mean, there's always to some degree, because you don't want, well, it happened in places, you know, in Britain, though it's, you know, a couple hundred years ago now almost, but um, where, you know, you just pour your poisonous, garbage of whatever from your manufacturing process into the river in which people got their water so you, know, you don't want that you need, you need a certain level of regulations now obviously to some degree back then they didn't understand all that you know in the late 18th early 19th century but just the, all the ramifications so you need certain levels of stuff but you want to set up a, a, a lemonade stand you got to get the government's permission what you know it, you know, it just, it becomes over, overburdensome. And so I don't know that it was ever a free market situation in Italy, but, but you had this great dislocation. So you had the rise of various socialistic groups, including fascism. So yes, a lot of the people liked a lot of the elements of fascism. Doesn't mean that they necessarily liked Mussolini or were fascist, but they liked a lot of that elements to it. But I don't know that, well, I know that Italy, because there were also still a lot of royalist types that were in the army and there was still a lot of support for various other um, communism and other um, ideologies, even under Mussolini, um, though he banned them from any political office. There was not a, um, a consensus, support, consensus support that Mussolini was the right guy for the job. And three, I don't know that Italy, A, um, the Italian people, I should say, wanted to be conquering all these other nations. They remember they did go through maybe not as big a horrors as some countries, but enough of the horrors of the First World War as well, and that they really cared about what Germany was doing, that they wanted to help their old enemy from the previous war as well as their ancient enemy. Remember, Hitler was an Austrian. People sort of know that Hitler was an Austrian. Austrians were the primarily in the north, but the occupiers of Italy. So they, this is the old enemy that they're now fighting alongside that a lot of people wanted to fight alongside so I think all three of those factors well culturally 
Um, also, and then, then the leadership factor. And we're getting back to where I was with Rommel. It took a while to get there. There used to be this series, you can, I'm sure, find it on whether Netflix or um, YouTube or whatever, called Connections. And this guy, I'm sure he's dead now, would talk about how things were connected through history. So we're getting there. He sort of circled back around to his starting point. So we're getting back to, to the starting point. The officer class in Italy was sort of just that, an officer class that didn't necessarily have a lot of contact with its um, NCOs. Um, yeah, I don't think they knew each other well. Um, you know, I think the, the, sergeants, the sergeants knew the officers and the sergeants knew the men. I don't think that there was nearly the, um, the interconnection that you find in some other armies, like the German army particularly. Trust me, the lieutenants and captains knew their, their, um, in the German army, knew, knew the privates in their, um, platoons and companies. Now, battalion, um, brigade and up, that's getting higher, but, but the junior officers knew their people. Um. I don't think that there was good leadership in the Italian army at this time. Some of it may come back to the various factors that, you know, they, the officers weren't necessarily fascist. They didn't feel they needed to die for the Germans or whatever. There may be some of that, but I just don't think that they were very good leadership set up in, in the Italian army. So the Italian soldiers, um, and I could go into another Napoleonic um, thing between that, but I won't at this time. Um, so the Italian soldiers did not stick to the fighting well because of bad equipment because i don't think they were generally the people in which you get the soldiers from were ideologically for various reasons wanting to conquer the mediterranean and fight this war and their leadership was poor so they did very poor in the war and this is getting back to Patton. this is where i think Patton was seeing he needed to show leadership yes he probably snapped and overdid it but i don't know that in that case, whether he should or shouldn't have not quite did what he did, but given him a stern talking to us, hey, you've got to get back up to that line. We're sending you back to your unit. You don't get to sit back here in this hospital. I don't blame him for that sentiment. Partially, like I say, they didn't necessarily understand all of the um, post-traumatic stress, but you're still not necessarily post-traumatic. You're still in the stress of fighting the war. Um, we can talk about some other times, and I'm sure it's more than more details than i know but um you know you get through the war and then you deal with the stuff and because you still have people out there dying and you got to win so that's part of the situation with Patton. so he gets embarrassed with that the newspapers see this he may have done it more often than than um was reported but it got reported a few times and so he gets fired from his job um now i'll tell you what when the enemy believes that a particular commander is your best, if he isn't actually your best, he's one of your best, period. Why? Well, um, even if he isn't such a, and you know, I'm not talking about Patton here, I'm just talking generally. Um, even if he isn't such a brilliant officer, maybe he's assembled a brilliant um, staff, and then that staff points out good things, and he's brilliant enough to go, yeah, that's a good plan, let's go for it. But, like I say, even if he's not your, your absolute best commander, but if your enemy thinks he is, then he scares your enemy. And winning a battle, like we talked about with the Western and Eastern Warfare, part of winning the battle, a major part, is the enemy's morale, including the leadership's morale. So if you can believe, you can make the enemy believe that they're defeated before the battle starts, you've won that battle. Oh, sure, you may have to go fight it. But they're already, and even if it's just, um, you know, at the officer level, the you know, the higher ranking officer level, even if it's just that, they're going to start be making plans about saving the situation that has yet to go bad, so that they have the mindset of being uh, losing. That's sort of what happened with Rommel in North Africa. He became, you know, the boogeyman for the British, and it was sort of really. Only once you get in there with Montgomery, who was not the greatest military leader in the sense of winning, you know, maneuver warfare like Patton was, but he got his people out of the mindset of being of losing to Rommel. He, you know, acknowledged 
publicly, I believe. I read his books, but um, he didn't talk about too much of that, and I haven't listened to all his speeches. But, you know, going around people, yeah, Rommel's a great general, or whatever he might say, but we, we're going to beat him kind of thing. And so, so he changed that mindset within the British Army that they can't stand up and, and defeat Rommel. So he did that very good. And so it wasn't really until Montgomery getting in there. So just because Rommel's attacking you with some tanks, you were already defeated in the British Army in North Africa to some degree. Not that you were going to be killed or everything else, but this isn't going to work out well. So Patton had that sort of viewpoint with the Germans. So he, if not absolutely the best, was one of the best generals for it. Now, when he gets sent back to England after this controversy, the British Army, I mean, the American Army weren't done with him, but it was a big, um, big problem that I think the Americans were over, the American public, the American leadership, whatever, was oversensitive to it. You know, you have a stern talking dip to Rommel, and then you, you put him back in there. Now, whether you, you need to take him out of the Italian command or not, that's a different matter. Um, I think he was probably better eventually out of it to fight in the North uh, Northern France operation because his style of warfare of maneuver um, would be allowed much more outside of the Italian peninsula than in. So that in itself. But once he gets back there, he makes at least one speech or maybe several speeches in which he talks about um, the West and Britain, America, and some of the others defeating Germany, basically ignoring the Soviet Union, the Soviet ambassadors or whoever feel offended and complain, so that gives another sort of um, black mark against um, Rommel. And this was, I mean, sorry, Patton. I mean, this was during some degree, during this FUSAG period, because they were use, running him around as sort of a publicity um, element to it um, to scare the Germans. And Patton may have not been the most diplomatic person on the... Um, one hand on the other hand he hated the soviets so he wasn't going to say good things about them naturally so that got him in more trouble so that's sort of the, the history with Patton is how he ended up here in charge of the phony army i think it was a mistake to put him in charge of the phony army why well um yes we get the idea that you're trying to convince them that it's a Calais operation. Well, the Germans were already convinced it was going to be a Calais operation. Though a few of their, supposedly a few of their brighter lights thought Normandy. But enough of them had already thought it was going to be Calais. And I have a suspicion that had Patton been um, not necessarily, you know, D-Day commander in the, the first few divisions that were put ashore, but the sort of... Um, Plan commander once you you got in here and got you know a few cores in there I think there would have been an earlier breakout I don't think I think there wouldn't have been the chance for the Germans to catch their breath as well that's my assessment and it's obviously a what if and I don't have you know oh in this case here the Patton would have done it differently than Bradley or whatever you know I, I don't have any details like that but I just just from reading various books on him including watching some of the famous movies but I think he would have broken out before because he was sort of belatedly given the army and then it was a breakout now you might say well he would have been stuck there too yeah but I think this sort of some generals you know they rightly so they're building up their um their resources which includes supplies because you don't want to start shooting a lot of our battle, you know, artillery in the battle, and then um, halfway through the artillery barrage, run out of ammo. So, well, we're bringing it from the beach as fast as we can. Yeah, but we're out of it now. So the idea is, is you sort of stockpile your supplies up to then overwhelm the enemy instead of just slowly pick at them. Not that they weren't firing at the enemy. They were of all calibers, but really push with it. Yeah, you need to do some of that, but, but Patton really was that type of person to Always push until you get pushed back on. And if you, you're pushing out with one squad, that's great. And then they get, you know, ambushed or too much fire and have to go to cover, fine. But you keep pushing with just that one little squad until they can't push anymore. And then you bring up 
as much as you can, platoons, companies, and you start attacking that position because it may be just four guys sitting on on a hill in trenches trying to you know do some you know covering fire that puts a squad of ten men you know to to cover while the the German army is bugging out. You know you don't necessarily wait until you get the battalion or the division or the brigade to attack the hill. You just get you know, platoon or a company or whatever there to push and you just keep pushing the enemy until you can't push them because once you get them bad footed uh, out of position, they start to crumble. And he was very much of that style of war. Remember, Patton had lots of experience. Patton fought in the First World War. He saw trench warfare from the American perspective in the First World War. He was the only officer to ever shoot at any of Pancho Villa's troops when the U.S. invaded Mexico hunting down Pancho Villa. He, so he experienced that, and he literally was maybe the only one actually firing, if I remember right, um, because Pancho Villa just disappeared from Pershing and in his invasion of Mexico. Um, but Patton was a young lieutenant at the time, riding around, I think, in a Model T car, as a scout, you know, I'm, you know, with um, like three or four guys, um, doing his mobile warfare, his modern cavalry, obviously no longer on horseback, um, hunting down guys on horseback, and he encountered them in in a village and um, shot it out with him. He, him, I believe, using his pistols, um, not the same famous pistols of later, but pistol shooting. Um, uh, these guys against rifles and um, you know that sort of semi-famous it's apocryphal but that scene in the, in the George C. Scott Patton movie where he you know gets strafed by the um, German airplanes while having the discussion about the air power situation and the Germans don't control the air and they get strafed and then he jumps out the window and jumps down on the building and shoots his I believe it's a 32 caliber hit but at most a 380 by the pistol it's the only pistol comes in only um, 380 or 32 shoots at that airplane with his pistol and it's sort of ridiculous and whatever else but you know I don't think that ever happened especially the jumping out of the second story building etc but if he were on the ground and that airplane flying over he would have pulled out his pistol and shot at them and he might have hit them not just hit the plane but hit, hit somebody on board because I believe he won a bronze medal at an Olympics for pistol shooting I forget which one, but, you know, it was, you know, way back, you know, like pre-World War One or something. Or, I don't know, one of the, one of the, I'm pretty sure this, maybe some other major sporting, of international sporting event. But, as one of the pistol shooters, he, I'm pretty sure it was a bronze medal. I may be off on a little bit of this detail here, and I don't remember if I ever knew which Olympics. But, one of the Olympics, he was a pistol competitor, medaled in the Olympics, shooting pistols. So, yes... Shooting it out with some of Pancho Villa's bandits somewhere in Mexico, um, using just a pistol, and him taking down guys with like they were using a lot of um, Mauser rifles and um, lever action type rifles. Yes, he was that good to to shoot somebody um, with a pistol. So he was that level of a combat um, soldier. So he knew maneuver warfare. He knew trench warfare and how not wanting to not be in it he was that level of an experienced soldier from mexico to world war one to really sort of taking over well he's the one that um did the western desert tank maneuvers out here in 29 palms area um really sort of sort of america's guderian in some ways in setting that up um he knew how bad the American tanks were. Supposedly, a friend of mine who was in the Marine Corps, that there's good evidence that some tanks disappeared that, that were patents. Um, the story goes is that they were getting ready to be shipped out to Europe, possibly, or, or somewhere else. And Patton had these really bad um, early model tanks. You can probably see in some of these, um, like War Thunder, the early American stuff, that he thought were junk. And they needed to go. So the story is, is that out in the desert, he buried them. And they go, well, I ain't got these tanks. I need replacements. Well, the tanks did supposedly disappear. 
And so he, you know, my friend and supposedly many Marine, because 29 Palms is now a Marine base. I don't know what it was then, or has been out there looking around the desert for a bunch of, because if you bury those tanks in the desert, they're probably almost in running condition out there. Um, depends on what, just where you buried them, but it's dry and whatnot. So if you buried them out there and the uh, 29 Palms right there, um, that's not quite, it's not quite that deserty. Um, it, oh, we don't have my my mod with the different pictures in them that have them shows what it looks like out there but it's scrub desert um buried those tanks out there so that he wouldn't well my friend looked and many other marines and others have gone looking for them that never found them um they'd be good museum pieces um so you know he he has that background in setting up america's armored forces and then eventually gets into North Africa. See, he is one of the best, the most experienced American commanders in World War II. And you can tell, yes, I am a fan. But, um, you know, he had his flaws. I'm not going to say he didn't have his flaws. Like I say, I think he snapped on the one or two soldiers and overdid it. And even even within the understanding of the time. Because have, you have to put people into their time and place. You know, you don't contend condemn Julius Caesar and some of the other guys for having slaves because in Rome they had slaves. They weren't like, it wasn't like in America that they were just black people. Oh, there were lots of Northern European slaves from conquering Gauls and whatever else. And I'm not saying it's right or good or acceptable. I'm just saying you have to judge them with the way they understood the world at the time. Um, you can still judge them badly. Um, you know, you don't have to judge them and say that they were all good. But you have to look and say, who, what culture do you find equal or better at the time? You know, so you can judge um, Greek culture versus Persian culture. I know the movie 300 and whatever, and they really did a propaganda um, sort of element on the Persians to make them out to be the wickedest sort of people in the world if you look at that movie. It's sort of a cool movie, but... Um, I doubt, no, I know the Persians weren't that wicked. They, um, they weren't that bad at all. But, you know, you still judge them between, you know, the, the Greeks and the Persians at the time. You don't just, ooh, these groups of Greeks had slaves or whatever and blah, 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 so they must be evil without realizing these are maybe the most enlightened people on the planet at the time. So, you know, this is what's sort of wrong with our modern educational system is they don't understand the world and they judge everything through the lens of, of today compared to what it was then. So that's, you know, need to look at that. Okay, so we're going to have FUSAG. And we don't do scrap metal. And since I've talked long enough, this episode's gone over long, but that's all right. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, got a few of you guys are commenting. That's cool. I appreciate that. And please keep it up. Um, but, you know, I don't mind a challenging um, opinion on one or more of these things. So sort of kind of reference to some degree, especially if it's been a while since this has been up exactly the point you're talking to me about. So I sort of remember all these things, but which episode did I say it and what are you referencing to? And you can always in your, um, if you want a specific fact or thing you want to challenge me on, there is a way to go, you pause the video and then you right click on it. And one of the things is, is um, get the URL of that video at that spot so I can quickly go in and, oh, you know, watch just that, you know, minute or two minutes of the video to know exactly what you're, you're talking about if you want to and i'm happy to discuss these things with you um i think lively debate's good as so long as we keep it as a interesting debate and not a personal attacks i'm very happy okay thanks for watching thanks for liking the videos i do appreciate that and like i was saying please comment see you next time for more hearts of iron